Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight's Intelligent Corporation Group. I'm super delighted to have Lewis Hammond here today to discuss the cooperative AI. And I'm first sorry that I can't be there with my video yet. I'll be joining in a second, but I just ended a little bit delayed. And so I'm still getting out of the plane. Anyway, I'm super delighted to have you here, Lewis. It was really fantastic to already collaborate with you at a few Foresight events in the past, now with you as a fellow, and then more recently with a wonderful, wonderful workshop that you and Divya co-hosted together, which was all about AI for institution design. And I'm hoping that we can maybe dig into that a little bit as well later. But for now, we're just really excited to hear more about your organization and about any projects that you have cooking up. Thanks for joining. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me to give the talk. And yeah, thanks all to for everyone for joining as well. And yeah, hopefully this will be interesting. So what I'm going to do in this talk is give a kind of overview of this new kind of burgeoning area of AI research, which I'm kind of referring to here as cooperative AI. Um, and I'll kind of talk through some of the motivations behind that, some examples of that, and then briefly at the end, get on to some of the things that I'm doing in my capacity at the Cooperative AI Foundation, which is the one kind of hat I wear. The second hat I wear is that I'm still kind of finishing up my PhD on, on kind of relevant topics based in Oxford at the Future of Humanity Institute in the Computer Science Department. So I think just before I get started, as it's a as it's only a kind of a relatively short presentation and we've got time for discussion afterwards, probably best to leave leave questions and clarifications and so on until the end. But yeah, if there's anything you, you do feel you want to kind of quickly ask or kind of butt in with as we're going along, then then do feel free. I can think I can just about see people's well, avatars, faces, sometimes videos. So yeah. Cool. I think there's just there's two more people in the waiting room, which I think I have permission to let in. And I assume I should be doing it because I don't know if anyone else is going to. So I'm just going to do that very quickly. And then. Sounds great. We'll also handle it from here. Thanks for that. Cool. Nice. I wasn't sure whether it was just me seeing those or not. Okay. Right. So as a little bit of kind of just overview of the short talk, then I'll start with kind of the motivation behind this kind of like subject area in general. I'll then kind of introduce what I actually mean by cooperative AI and talk a little bit about it and its relations to relationships to other topics in the kind of AI safety and, and other places. Provide a few examples of what this looks like in practice. These examples are now slightly outdated, but hopefully they'll do the job. And then briefly talk about this cooperative AI foundation at the end. And then, yeah, hopefully leave plenty of time for discussion as well, which I'm looking forward to. The kind of first kind of motivating kind of big picture claim I want to make, which is not hopefully particularly controversial is that kind of cooperation is extremely important and many of the most important problems facing us, in fact, as a kind of species, as a civilization, are problems of cooperation, whether that's things like climate change, war, pandemics, et cetera, among many others, including, for instance, the governance of emerging technologies, et cetera, which is, I know, something that this group potentially thinks about a little bit more. And at the same time, many of our greatest successes have also been due to our ability to cooperate. So I'm thinking of things like trade, treaties, various kinds of collaboration and so on. And a kind of secondary point here is that as our societies, economies, militaries, etc., become more powerful and more connected, the need for cooperation becomes greater. So we didn't have to worry about such complex cooperation problems, maybe when we we're all kind of small tribes and little islands. But as the world becomes increasingly kind of interconnected and we have increasingly large amounts of power in various senses of that word, then the need for cooperation becomes greater because the stakes are higher, but also the potential gains are greater as well. So that's the first claim. The second claim I want to make is that AI is going to become increasingly important to the cooperation problems and opportunities that we face. So this is because getting back to that previous point I made that advanced AI will increase both the power and the interconnectedness of actors and hence the need for, but also hopefully the feasibility of cooperation. So there's two ways to view this, I think, at least. Uh, and on the one hand, um, AI systems might end up exacerbating some of our worst kind of cooperation problems that exist. One possible kind of instance of this that you might point at is something like the flash crash, which I'm sure many of you kind of all know about. So it happened kind of maybe earlier in the 2000s. And in a very short space of time, you can see, in fact, the time scale on the, on the kind of x-axis of this little plot to the right, huge, huge, vast quantities of, of, of wealth were kind of wiped off the stock market around the order of a kind of trillion dollars or something around that sort of order of magnitude before, fortunately, it kind of sprung back to where, roughly where it ought to have been. And this was basically due to a series of kind of automated trades being made between kind of various automated trading agents that kind of quite rapidly spiraled out of control at a scale and at a speed where human oversight wasn't really kind of able to fix this. 
And there was a lot of work done afterwards in kind of assessing exactly where this came from and exactly how this went wrong. But the concern is that we might end up with, with many more situations like this and in, in other kind of high stakes scenarios. But on the other hand, this is the kind of more positive framing. We might ask if we can kind of reverse this question. So humans are okay at cooperating. We do it in a bunch of places, but it's fair to say that we could be better. And we use AI tools all the time to help us with, with various things. And so the question here is whether we might be able to use AI to actually help, help us cooperate better as well. So yeah, that's what this is. Okay. So before continuing as well, I do want to mention that there are in some ways kind of downsides to cooperation as well in the sense that cooperative capabilities can be dual use in an important sense. So for example, forming credible commitments might allow us to reach kind of various agreements between each other and so on that would otherwise be kind of difficult to enforce and yet might be mutually beneficial. And yet credible commitments can also be used to make credible threats. Similarly, greater interconnectedness and interdependence might actually increase the fragility of a kind of larger complex system. And potentially things like forming alliances could be used to create larger factions. This seems good. But if then that kind of tips the balance in favor of conflicts between those larger factions, say, for example, because the cost benefit or the kind of risk benefit kind of ratio changes with larger factions, then we might end up with kind of a greater likelihood of kind of conflict than if we had kind of multiple smaller factions who was in no one's best interest to be kind of fighting any sort of fight. So I think this is all kind of worth mentioning. And in general, I've actually, you can think of kind of cooperation with negative externalities as, as collusion in some sense, right? It's, it's cooperation where we don't want cooperation. This is essentially what collusion is. And so actually more and more, I've been thinking about this kind of problem of cooperation in the context of AI systems as how do we actually control or manage the level of cooperation that we might have in the context of AI systems? It is especially important when we might rely, for example, on some cases on things like adversarial training, where actually we pit two AI systems against one another, and this leads to kind of greater or more robust, better or more robust solutions for us. So one thing here that we might want to focus on is this idea of differential progress on cooperation, by which I mean, I broadly mean advances in AI capabilities that help us with cooperation problems more than they help us with other things. And so one little kind of toy, toy picture that kind of illustrates this, which is due to Alan Defoe, is this idea that there might be many trajectories, trajectories that we might take towards kind of more generally intelligent or even super intelligent AI systems. And we, in some, we have kind of some choice about kind of what capabilities we invest in, which capabilities we try to advance kind of on that, on that path. And the kind of cooperative AI bet in some sense is that it would be beneficial for us to try and focus on some of these ideas that might push us more towards kind of cooperative capabilities than other sorts of capabilities. Now, you might reasonably think that there might not be many such things that, that truly do that. And I think that's a very interesting open question, the extent to which we might be able to identify such kind of areas to push on. One kind of extremely kind of toy example of that motivates this, for example, that motivates this, this distinction and that maybe gives some hope that there might be other things in this bucket is, for example, the idea of a cheap talk channel, which is a, a communication channel between a bunch of players in a strategic decision making scenario via which they can communicate, but where which they can't necessarily use this communication to create kind of binding actions and commitments and so on. So this is the sense in which it's cheap talk. And of course, because these, this communication is non-binding, then at the, very, at the very least, you could just ignore it. So there's no reason it should really kind of cost you anything to have this. And yet it might be able to provide gains in the sense that it could allow for, for improved coordination. Okay. So with that kind of motivation and kind of background stuff out of the way, I want to talk a little bit more about what I slightly more concretely mean by this idea of cooperative AI before getting further, even more concrete afterwards by providing some examples. And so before I talk about kind of what is cooperative AI, I want to talk where is cooperative AI in the sense of where it falls within the broader landscape of this project of making AI go well, broadly construed. So one kind of extremely coarse and not always totally correct way of carving up the space is into technical work and non-technical work. And then under technical work, you have things like work on alignment, work on interpretability, robustness, et cetera, and also work on cooperative AI, among other things. And in the kind of technical side of things, you have stuff on policy. You have norms, institutions, all sorts of stuff to do with governance, et cetera. And so cooperative AI lies under this kind of technical branch, but it ends up kind of often looking at problems which look like kind of standard kind of cooperation problems that you might see in kind of non-technical work and in governance scenarios, et cetera. So this is often a kind of slight point of confusion, which is why I kind of like this diagram just to kind of make that especially clear what's going on here. 
then the more of the what. So the way I would define cooperative AI is it's a subfield of AI that aims to improve the ability of AI systems to engender cooperation between humans, machines, and organizations. Well, broadly, organizations can be thought of just kind of groups of humans and machines and or machines. And the overall aim here is help to reduce risks, potentially existential risks as well, resulting from cooperation failures, which, as I've mentioned, I think it's increasingly likely might and involve AI in the future for better or worse. So in that sense, it forms quite a natural complement to technical work on alignment, as well as non-technical work in AI governance and so on. So another way to potentially frame this is, is, the, is, is this is the task of improving the cooperative intelligence of AI systems, where one kind of working definition of what it means for an agent to be cooperatively intelligent, which I'm kind of borrowing liberally from the Leg Hooter definition of universal intelligence here, which was quite influential within the AI literature, um, is as follows which is the cooperative intelligence of an agent is its ability to achieve high joint welfare in a variety of environments with a variety of other agents. And one thing I want to draw your attention to here is that this definition actually focuses on an agent's abilities rather than its dispositions, right? So it's all very well kind of meaning to cooperate if you're actually terrible at doing so and vice versa, you might be perfectly capable of cooperating and, and helping everyone else along and making sure everything's great, but you might not want to. And the latter thing is also obviously incredibly important but more falls under this kind of standard bracket of, of alignment. And the distinction between these two things is something I want to talk about just briefly next to dive into it in a little bit more detail. So one way I sometimes like doing this is with these extremely kind of, kind of cartoonish childlike pictures where we can view alignment here as a process that takes here a principle with some certain preferences and denoting preferences, different preferences in different colors. And we have a robot, an agent, so a principal agent, classic principal agent problem in a sense, that we want to align to the human's preferences. Cooperation, on the end of the hand, has a sort of different kind of type signature in some sense, in that we assume we just have a collection of agents. They all have different preferences. Those preferences are fixed. It's not like we're aligning anyone's preferences to anyone others. And given those agents and their preferences, etc., we want to make sure that some kind of good outcomes occur for all involved, ideally. And again, extremely kind of simple and coarse way of, of thinking about this, but I do think it hints at one of the main things that I want to try and get across here, which is that if you can think of kind of composing these two processes in a sense, where we start off with a bunch of humans and, and a bunch of machines and so on, and then we end up in a situation where we have a bunch of humans with high joint welfare and potentially also machines, is bracketing very much the question of whether machines will be moral patients anytime near in the future. I'm not disputing that, but, but yeah, it's kind of orthogonal to what I'm trying to say here, which is that in some sense, kind of this classical alignment view of getting, a, getting an AI system to do what you want it to do is only actually kind of part of the problem. And that very soon we're going to end up in a multi-agent world in, in many, in a greater sense than we already are, and that we'll have to solve, we'll have to solve these sorts of problems as well. Okay. One kind of final way of viewing this, which is again, due to a paper from Alan Defoe and others from DeepMind, is that alignment can be seen in some sense as addressing a vertical coordination problem and cooperation can be seen as addressing a horizontal problem where we again have pictures that look a little bit like this. And here the vertical axis indicates some notion of kind of normative priority. So we actually do, for instance, stipulate that we care more about, say, the principal's preferences being, being executed than the agent's preferences. And here I'm, I'm making those kind of humans and machines, but in general, that, not, that need not be the case. Whereas in kind of cooperation problems, we don't necessarily think, usually at least, that any one particular agent in the context of a group has kind of priorities above and beyond any of the others. Okay. And of course, really, the world is, is much more complicated than that picture on the left. It's, it's also much more complicated than this extremely simple picture as well. But this is one way of carving up the various relationships that agents have to one another when we think about kind of coordination problems. Okay. So for the kind of penultimate section of the talk then, and for the most of the time that remains, I'm just going to actually run through some examples of what cooperative AI research looks like. And then hopefully this will provide a little bit of context for, for some of the discussions later. So most, I'm going to start by talking about a little frame this in terms of most existing work in, in AI and also in AI safety more generally, or sorry, more specifically rather, which is that most work in AI focuses implicitly or otherwise on a kind of single agent setting. And Multi-agent work that is studied is often adversarial. This is AlphaGo, and in fact, you know, most of the most of the games we see in AI are in AI research are zero-sum games, right? For various reasons, 
and whether that whether that it's because that's about competitive game playing or whether it's because that it relates to a notion of robustness for instance if if you can kind of do well against a, a worst case adversary then presumably you're doing pretty well when there is no such adversary present and then the first of these two things is also true for the subfield of ai safety and alignment more generally that there's often implicitly a human in the mix here so no doubt many of you have seen this nice little gif of this kind of sausage leg who's been kind of taught to do a backflip from by kind of humans observing various clips of the of the kind of leg attempting to do backflips and kind of saying yes or no this one was better that one was better etc so implicitly when we talk about kind of getting an agent to do what a human wants even if the human is not actually taking actions at, in the kind of setting and the the kind of machine is acting purely on a human's behalf we do in fact have a human kind of in there but it's a relatively kind of weak sense of having a, a human kind of involved or it's a kind of somewhat kind of degenerate case of a multi-agent system multi-agent scenario which is in contrast to many of the things that I'm about to talk about now. One thing you might reasonably ask as well, I think, and this is very fair, is that why, is, why are cooperation problems in the context of AI different? Why is what I'm good about to talk about not just the same as generic AI research, or why is it not just the same as generic research into cooperation, of which there is much? And I think there's two things here to point out. So the first is that cooperation can actually be harder in the context of AI systems because AI agents don't possess some of the features that allow biological creatures to cooperate more easily. At the same time, cooperation might be easier in the context of advanced AI systems because they might be constructed to have non-biological features that allow for better cooperation or for allow for humans to cooperate in ways that which they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. I'll try to identify some of those things as I continue. So collectively then these features introduce a range of various kind of challenges and opportunities, some of which are as follows. So one of one kind of cluster of interesting ideas here is about the problem of just understanding the world, which is a general thing that comes up all the time, but specifically as well of understanding the behavior and preferences of other agents dealing with kind of recursive beliefs, by which I mean things like, I believe that you believe that I believe that you believe, etc., which come up all the time in kind of multi-agent settings. There's also questions around how agents can form commitments to one another, maybe via various devices involving delegation, contracts, hardware, all sorts of things. Similarly, there are things, there are problems around kind of communication and communicating effectively over kind of common ground where we kind of both know that we're referring to the same things, for instance, dealing with problems of bandwidth and latency, teaching, learning from others, etc. And then finally, a slightly more kind of zoomed out one, which is about this idea of institutions, which help humans cooperate all the time. And yet we don't really have so much of it in, in the context of AI systems. And this can be kind of informal institutions such as norms, reputation systems, et cetera, but also potentially more kind of formal practices in organizations. So in the next kind of few slides, I'm basically just going to pick an example from each of these four kind of broad clusters and just talk about it in a little bit more detail to hope flash out exactly what it is that the field looks like at the moment, noting that actually these slides are a little bit outdated at this point. So much of this work is actually not especially recent, but hopefully it's still relatively representative. I've just advanced multiple slides in one. Oh, here we go. So first one about kind of understanding and about the Bayesian inference of intentions. Part of what helps humans cooperate is that we have a theory of mind that allows us to better understand the intentions of others. And we might therefore reasonably ask how we might imbue machines with a theory of mind who don't typically possess such a thing. So one idea for doing this is to use a notion of, of what's called Bayesian inverse planning. And why might this help in the context of cooperation? Well, imagine that we're kind of jointly trying to complete some task and that there are various subtasks that others are working on and we need to choose the best subtask to work on ourselves. One way we can kind of check the kind of probability of the task that others are working on, given observations of their actions, is by inverting this using Bayes rule and then kind of computing these other quantities. So the context in which this has been studied a little bit so far is in a kind of toy version of this kind of game Overcooked, where you have kind of two little chefs running around in a grid world, and they need to make this extremely boring salad comprising simply tomatoes and lettuce. But interestingly, or kind of importantly, I guess, recipes like this are interesting because they are nice kind of canonical examples of partially ordered tasks that have a kind of partial ordering structure to them where some things needed to be, need to be kind of completed in sequence and some of them can be done in parallel and so on. So this is a nice kind of test case for thinking about how agents might learn to break up tasks between themselves and complete them jointly. So yeah, this is a specific paper I'm talking about, which is Rose Wang, Els paper from I think one or two years ago now, 
but the probability of, of any action given some task that an agent can is trying to com complete can be just computed using this kind of forward pass of, of some kind of planning or learning algorithm, assuming that that other agents are approximately optimal. And then we can compute this prior interim by, by assuming that the likelihood of a given task being completed is proportional to the reward that can be achieved from that subtask in the current state. So we should think that agents are more likely to be achieving, are more likely to be attempting to complete tasks where they can achieve a higher reward. And once you have these two kind of things in play, you can ignore this kind of normalization constant of the, the distribution of actions and compute this probability of task given action, learn what tasks other people or infer what tasks other people are trying to do based on their actions, and then use that information to complete the remaining tasks yourself. So that's, that's one idea here. Another example related to this idea of commitments is, is the idea of programs as verifi verifiable commitments, which some of you in the call might already be familiar with. I know it's a topic that occasionally comes up in the context of some of Foresight's thinking and events and so on. So there are many reasons, for example, that agents fail to reach efficient outcomes. One example of this might be mutual cooperation, as I've misspelled here in the mutual and in, in the prisoner's dilemma. And one way that this this fails to happen is because humans, for instance, are not necessarily always able to make credible commitments to one another. But AI agents are different in that they are written in code that can be read and verified by others. And this comes up all the time in kind of computer, computer security and formal verification and all sorts of other places. So this leads more generally to the idea of open source game theory, which is the same as game theory, the study of kind of multiple kind of rational agents and the decisions they make. But here, we have the agents, the decision-making processes those agents use are at least partially transparent to one another. So for example, if your, if your decision-making process is written in some code, then maybe we can leverage the fact that it's written in code and that AI systems and other computer programs can reason about code to, to, to some gains, to, to, to lead to some gains. So you can imagine, for example, that each agent in a prisoner's dilemma plays not by selecting an action, but actually, but actually by submitting a program instead such as the following program, which is called my program. And what it does takes as input your program, it outputs either cooperate or defect, and it runs as follows, which is if your program is equal to my program, then I'm gonna cooperate and otherwise I'm gonna defect. And it doesn't take too much thinking to see that if both agents use such a program and they play the game, play the prisoner dilemma using this, using this program, then they're gonna both end up reaching cooperate and we're gonna get mutual cooperation. And so this is a very kind of cute toy example. And there are many reasons why such a cute toy example might break down in the real world, not least because it's implemented on kind of physical hardware and so on. There might be multiple backdoors, et cetera. But I do think it points to an interesting idea, which is the subject of much of my own work at the moment, which is broadly the question of how we might use AI systems to monitor, oversee, and or verify other AI systems in a kind of scalable and recursive way. And how this, we might get to kind of scaffold essentially ourselves towards kind of safer AI systems that are very powerful using techniques like this. Anyway, so that's one thing there. Penultimate example then is on this topic of communication. So again, you can see a recurring theme here is that, okay, how do agents fail to cooperate? Well, one reason is because they can't do this, they can't do that and so on. And one, one such thing is that they might not be able to communicate with one another effectively. And for complex tasks, especially with AI systems, this is actually maybe less the case now that we have, for instance, like very, very kind of strong advances in, in natural language processing capabilities. But in general, we might not necessarily want to stipulate that agents use a particular kind of communication protocol or language, um, and we might want them to learn to communicate by themselves. So suppose, for example, that we have a cooperative, multi-agent and partially observable setting in a kind of reinforcement learning type, type domain. Well. One thing we can do is we can augment each agent's action space with a message space, also known as a cheap talk channel, as I referred to earlier. And we can actually kind of exploit this cheap talk channel even further. So not just letting agents talk to each other when they're trying to achieve some goal, but we can also exploit this in training time as well uh, via the agents communicating gradients to one another. So let me just flesh that out a tiny bit more. This is a potentially, depending on your background, fairly opaque diagram in terms of it's a little bit more complicated than perhaps it ought to be for the purposes of this example. But the basic point here is that you have two agents. You have this thing called a QNET, which they're using to evaluate how good certain actions are in certain contexts. And yeah, using that to make their selections. You can see as inputs to this QNET, we have various messages, M, observations, O, and you can see them outputting various actions. 
these red lines here and they're interacting in some environment, et cetera, in this kind of sequential fashion over time. So you have T, time step T, and then time step T plus one and so on. And you can see this, this red arrow here going flowing from the environment back through to the agent is essentially the reward, is essentially what the agent is, is back propagating in order to update its, its parameters, et cetera, in order to select better actions in the future. So that's what that kind of classically looks like, or that's one kind of classical picture for what that looks like. And the advancement made by, by this work, which is a work I'm referring to by someone called Jakob Förster, who did this when he was previously at Oxford. He then went away from Oxford and has now come back to work on some more kind of cooperative AI type things. The kind of advance that they make here is to actually propagate this, back propagate this loss signal even further. So we could ignore for, for now this kind of DRU box. What I want to draw your attention to is the fact that these red arrows now pass all the way back through the first agent's kind of CNET here instead of QNET, but the, the idea is approximately the same. And then they keep going all the way back to the other agent's CNET. And the intuition behind this is as follows. If I'm cooperating with you, I want to have some signal of knowing how helpful my actions were for you or not, as the case might be. And it's very hard to know this in general. This is a kind of multi-agent credit assignment problem. So if I take some action and then you go off and you achieve some reward, did you achieve some reward because I performed that action or in spite of the fact that I performed that action? Well, the way that they kind of get around this issue here is that by kind of backpropagating one agent's kind of reward that it gets through the, the decision-making process, the CNET that they use to select the actions that led to that reward, and then in further kind of essentially kind of computing the, the change in one agent's function as a function of the, what the previous agent did, then essentially the previous agent can learn how much its action affected what the other agent is doing which in turn did or did not lead to some rewards. So this is kind of one way in which I might learn, for example, kind of how, how much I'm helping or hindering you. And therefore this leads to kind of greatly, greatly improved kind of coordination and, and kind of the ability to solve these kind of complex multi-agent problems. Okay. Final example then, which is on the topic of institutional design. This also relates to something Alison was talking a little bit about just in the opening here, which is that the, the foundation, the Cooperative AI Foundation recently hosted a workshop on AI for institutions uh, and how AI might be able to help us improve or, or create new sorts of institutions, whether that's kind of, kind of deliberative kind of platforms, collective decision-making tools. Yeah. All sorts of, all sorts of kind of, of things and, and topics came up there. And one kind of very cute example of this is, is the one I'm going to talk about here. So institutions such as norms, laws, other governance structures are critical in, in the case of humans for, for achieving more cooperative outcomes. And so one thing we can ask is about what institutions we might create for AI systems. There aren't so many of those. Um, but another thing we can ask is whether AI systems can actually help us create better institutions for humans. And yeah, the toy example I'm going to talk about here is something you might have already come across as was a few kind of cute videos of it floating around online about a year and a half, two years ago, is this idea of an AI economist. But one thing that we might use AI to help us do, or at least test our intuitions for, not necessarily just kind of plug and play, let it go sort of thing, but is to help us derive more equitable and productive taxation schemes. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. So what this team from, from MIT, sorry, from Harvard and Salesforce do, I think David Parks is on the paper. He's not the lead author, but that's, that's the thing. The AI economist, what they do is they create this very cute little grid world where we have a bunch of agents running around, gathering resources, cutting down trees, building houses, trading with each other and so on, trading resources with each other, et cetera. And these agents have different capabilities. They're, they're variously good or bad at getting certain kinds of, building certain kinds of structures, getting certain kinds of rewards for them and so on. So that's the kind of first layer. And then the back of this little picture, you have a, the second layer, which is some financial institution, some bank, which here just has the very simple job of uh, proposing a redistributive tax rule where some amount of income from the agents is, is gathered and then redistributed. And in general, when you're thinking about these sorts of tax rules, there's often a trade-off to be made between the equality that you end up with and the productivity. So ideally we want to kind of redistribute the gains from more productive or kind of competent agents to benefit those who are less able to kind of fend for themselves and so on. And yet if we do that too much, and if we tax agents too highly, then they won't be inclined to go out and kind of produce those, produce that wealth to begin with. 
And so there's this trade-off here between the quality and productivity. And essentially what they do in this particular environment is that they have kind of bi-level multi-agent reinforcement learning set up where first of all, you have all the little agents who are little running around learning what to do and et cetera. And at the same time, you have this secondary reinforcement learning agent, which is the bank, which is updating its parameters, which are here just the parameters of the kind of tax rule, essentially adjusting the tax brackets, adjusting the percentages that agents are taxed and so on in a kind of kind of mutual kind of learning, learning fashion in a sense. So the agents adapt to the tax rule that's being set. The bank adapts to what the agents are doing and sets a new tax rule and so on. And they show that if you employ a kind of such an approach like this in this very basic setting, then you can end up doing better, by which I mean closer to the Pareto boundary, which is in many ways implicitly what I've been talking about when I've been talking about kind of more cooperative outcomes or kind of higher joint welfare, et cetera, often what we think about in at least as a first approximation, is getting towards the Pareto boundary, Pareto frontier. And they compare it against a number of other kind of classic economic kind of tax bracket formulas, such that it's the US Federal's federal formula and the size formula here. Okay, so that was the final example. The last thing I'm just going to say before I close is I'm going to give a quick plug for this place I work, the Cooperative AI Foundation. So this is a new a charitable entity. You can see the trustees there surrounding me. So this is originally in many ways the brainchild of Alan Defoe, who previously was at the center for the governance of AI, has now moved to DeepMind. This is Eric Horvitz, Microsoft, Gillian Hadfield at Toronto, variously OpenAI, schwartz Weissman Institute. This is Rudolly on the bottom left and Dario Amadei of Anthropic on the bottom right. And this is the kind of mission statement, so to speak, of, of the foundation, which is to support research that will improve the cooperative intelligence of advanced AI for the benefit of all. So essentially, we're a kind of field building organization and focused specifically on this question of, of cooperative AI and how AI might help us to solve cooperation problems. If you want to, if you do want to find out more, we have an online seminar series, which is currently paused, but will be resuming soon. There's a mailing list via which everything gets announced. You can have a look at our website, which is kind of slowly getting fleshed out. We're still in the process of hiring and growing and so on, but there's, there's definitely some stuff up there already. And further reading, which is a good start. Sometimes there's a, there's a commentary in nature about this from, from some of the trustees. And then there's this slightly older paper called Open Problems in Cooperative AI, which is from Alan and a bunch of folks at DeepMind, kind of outlining in a little bit more detail what some of the kind of canonical issues in this field currently are and how they might be solved in the future. So that is it. Thank you very much all for, for listening and for your patience. And I'm um, yeah, really looking forward to hearing any thoughts that you, that you might have about this stuff. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Louis. This was quite the mouthful. I have tons of questions, but let's start with some audience questions. This is a reminder that if you want to ask a question, we'll be starting with questions that have been dropped in the chat. And then afterwards, we can move on to any questions that you have by raising hand. Feel free to also continue the discussion in the chat in the meantime. And if you, Lewis, have any links that you want to share, then please feel free to drop them in the chat now as well. And then people can already pick them up now. Okay, we'll start with David Mannheim. Do you want to kick it off? Sure. Lewis, I, I can't really say a long time to see, but uh, it's good to see you. One of the things that you kind of put out as a, a goal for cooperative AI is trustworthiness of commitments by the system. So they, they should be able to trust one another. My question is, is that embedding kind of all of the rest of the AI safety as a sub-problem for cooperative AI? Because if we can have these systems in a trustworthy and verifiable way, say what they will or won't do, kind of already solved everything that like, you know, that, that Yudkowsky has given up on solving, I guess is, is the way I would put that. That seems like a a bad way of going about the problem. Am, am I misunderstanding something? I think it's a fair, it's a fair question because often we do frame the problem of, of AI safety more generally in terms of trustworthiness or whatever, or being able to have certain guarantees that an AI system is going to do certain things or is not going to do certain things. I think that the difficulty there is um, it all depends on your kind of specification language in the sense that if you could actually write down a specification for an AI system doing only what you wanted and never what you didn't want, and you could express your preferences in that, in that sense and express maybe some kind of value system, et cetera, and, and do that, then indeed, I think you more or less would have, and if you could get some sort of proof that that was indeed the case, then I think you basically would have solved the problem. And the issue, of course, is that we can't, we don't have specification languages that can do those sorts of things. So in that way, 
I see not this kind of verification, this mutual kind of commitments and so on, et cetera, as a, as a silver bullet in any way, but just as potentially one building block that might help us get towards potentially safer, more modular kind of trustworthy systems, but by no means kind of solving the entire problem. I think you do absolutely still need stuff to do with interpretability, stuff to do with preference learning, stuff to do with all sorts of other things, but this might be kind of one useful component in, in scaling that and, and in kind of, yeah, making, getting getting kind of harder and fast, faster assurances in certain cases. Thank you. Wonderful. Next one up, we have Jazeel. Hi, uh, it was great presentation. This is definitely immediately relevant to some, some work I'm doing. I feel like LLMs have pushed AI to the forefront of society because their interface, which is natural language, is so easily accessible and they're, they're very versatile. They don't tend to have mathematical precision or even any form of determinism, frankly, from method to method. And yet they're, they're, they're very, they're able to sort of build things like pseudo languages and things that are kind of deterministic or deterministic enough that you can start from planning operations around them, in which case things like what you're saying make are immediately applicable. And so my question to you is when you think about the toy examples you've described, as you actually experimented or looking at things, we don't just have a small number of workers and a small number of choices they can make but actually very large numbers of, of options that, that kind of correspond to real world things. And, and we're evaluating not with like deterministic analysis of what are happening, but maybe fuzzy analyses due to like text or images, because I imagine some of the logic and the, the heuristics you're describing would be relevant, even if we don't get the pure mathematical determination that a lot of these like older AI research problems are usually based on. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a great point and is is definitely consistent with some of the thinking that we've been doing recently insofar as many of the kind of like classical studies of cooperation problems and so on are couched in this kind of formal theoretical game theoretic language, which we know has all sorts of kind of problems and defects when we try to apply it to real the real world and, and so on. In some ways, AI systems are actually kind of an interesting case there because they're closer in some respects to the kind of purely rational kind of utility maximizing agents of economic analysis. And so you might hope that that some of the kind of standard concepts there might be slightly more applicable in the context of AI systems. But nonetheless, I do think there's a lot of work to be done. And then, yeah, as, as regarding this kind of slightly larger open-ended kind of potentially language-based or various modality-based sorts of things that we're now seeing more and more of, this is absolutely something that we're now trying to trying to kind of work towards, trying to think about what kind of cooperative AI evals, benchmarks, and so on would look like in the case of large language models, how we might, yeah, construct those things, think about those things. I think one interesting test case for this, for example, or test bed for this is the, the idea of negotiation in natural language, right? So negotiation has a long history in AI research, automated negotiation. But as far as I'm aware, this has not really been discussed that much in the context of large language modeling, at least not yet. So there, I think it very soon will be. But I do think this provides a great test bed for for looking at the cooperative capabilities, dispositions, and so on, if you can call them that, of, of these kind of larger, more open-ended systems. But yeah, how you, still the, there is a, a question about how you extrapolate from these kind of benchmarks and these kind of toy domains into worrying about what happens in the real world. Yeah, I think there are other concerns in AI safety regarding that too, like how you might try and enforce some notion of myopia to stop agents kind of taking the extremely kind of long-term kind of damaging kind of actions and so on. But yeah, I think it's very much a challenging thing to do. Awesome. Wonderful. Next one up, we have Alan Karp, who had his hand up. Uh, yeah, about 20 years ago, I did some work in automated negotiation. So I'm glad you, you mentioned that. And uh, I, I designed a system which was very different from the standard kind of the negotiation where I say, here's a deal, take it or make a counteroffer in that the, the goal was to explore the space of possible deals. And there are some attributes that are competitive, like price, and some that are cooperative. We both want a short delivery time. And I go into a store and I say, I want to bear, buy a pair of shoes. And the clerk says, what color? And I say, oh, that's my utility function. I'm not going to tell you. That's, that's the kind of thing that this exposed. And, and what, I, what my code discovered was the Nash equilibrium of making an ultimatum. And I also discovered why we don't make an ultimatum, which is we're exploring the other party's constraints. 
You want to make an offer where they won't walk away from the deal. And I don't know if this is applicable to the kind of cooperative AI you're looking at, but I do have a sequence, a series of papers on that and one that I could get published. If there's any interest in that, I can, you can contact me. Thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, that is right up the kind of, is very much within scope for this sort of stuff, specifically focusing on these kind of general sum settings, not necessarily always purely cooperative or purely competitive. And, and I think that's where the world is general sum. And I think that's where it gets really interesting. And uh, yeah, this, this idea of the fact that there's kind of value of information in some sense to kind of exploring and learning about your opponent before necessarily committing to things and kind of, yeah, inferring their preferences and their willingness to kind of accept or decline certain deals is, is yeah, very much, very much the sort of thing that we'll be kind of looking at as kind of, yeah, pure, pure, pure in some sense, examples of these kind of cooperation and competition. And the key part was the rules for making a counteroffer were key to this discovery. Okay. okay. Not the standard rules for making a counteroffer. Nice. I will, I will contact you. <laughs> so I would like to see this. Thank you. I have a general question. Like earlier when you talked about the difference, I guess, between like alignment and cooperation, you talked about alignment as like a principal agent problem. And that oftentimes that's perhaps not the best way to think about the cooperative. But, but like, if you think about cooperative systems that are large enough, including like kind of existing civilizations or societies, they involve lots of principal agent problems that have to be solved on sub levels to kind of like lead to this compositionality of cooperation that we have in civilization. So I wonder if you could speak to that and like how thick you think that distinction is or yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think this was what this is exactly what you're referring to is what I was trying to gesture at gently with this kind of diagram where you have actually kind of a whole sea of various kind of arrows in some sense, some vertical, some horizontal in the sense that some of these are kind of principal agent kind of delegation type problems uh, where we have kind of some sort of normative precedence, as I said, and some of them are just kind of these kind of more kind of classic horizontal kind of true kind of coordination problems where there's no particular agent who we think has normative precedence there at all. And yeah, I think I'm put, one of the things I'm working on currently, actually just more or less in my own research and supervising some other students to work on this topic currently is the, is the relationship between these two things, right? And I think this really is, is actually very understudied. So if you imagine an extremely simple setting, you just have two principles, you have two agents, then there's a bunch of different things that can go wrong here. So the first is that principles and agents can be misaligned to each other. And that might be because, for instance, they have very, very different utility functions, or it might be that they have exactly the same utility functions, but the agent is just totally incompetent, right, of, of, of maximizing its utility function. And so there's at least two different ways in which that can break down. And then separately, you also have actions between the agents, assuming the principles are not in the game, so to speak, they're just delegating all of their actions to the agents. And then you have, again, this like this idea of alignment, but here kind of horizontal alignment, so to speak, again, just between how similar are your reward functions? And you have some notion of cooperative capabilities. And one idea, one kind of very quick kind of check to see that these are actually not the same thing is that imagine we're in a coordination game where we can go left or we can go right. If we both go left, then great, we get reward one. If we both go right, we, both, we also both get reward one. If we accidentally miscoordinate and you go left and I go right, then we get minus 100. There's an equilibrium, there's an equilibrium selection problem there, despite our reward functions being precisely identical. So we're fully aligned. We're as, as aligned as we could possibly be. And yet coordination is not always totally straightforward. And so these different kind of factors essentially that make cooperation and alignment and et cetera hard have only really, I think so far as, as low as, as, as I understand it, at least been studied in relative isolation. And so some of the work that I'm doing at the moment is thinking about how these various things trade off against each other, both from a kind of theoretical and an empirical perspective. But I do think there's just huge amounts more work to be done there and understand those trade-offs and how certainly if you, you can again think about it in terms of, well, if you have that in terms of sub games and so on, if you have a network effects, if you have all sorts of other things, you get very complicated very quickly. So yeah, lots to be done. I don't have the answer. Wonderful. There's also this really cool, I think, kind of diagram about how to align different, I guess, like agents with each other, mostly in the kind of like kind of sense of computer security, which is also about like selecting an agent, selecting the reward, monitoring the agent and so forth, and what that means in a human to human, human to computer and computer to computer uh, object scenarios. So I think this kind of like this, this kind of like cooperation strategies that evolves like different, a different agents across like very different domains is, I think, really, really interesting. And yeah, thanks for pointing that out. 
Next one up, we have David. Yeah, I, I, want, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the rebellion and di disobedience in AI work. If you, I mean, for no, actually, I don't. Okay. Think. So the, the, there, there's supposed to be a conference in a month or so in the UK. I should send that to you. But Excellent. one of the, one of the kind of key questions is if you imagine a seeing eye dog. So the, the person's walking and they say, okay, great. I want to cross the street and the dog doesn't let them. And they say, no, 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 but I want to cross the street. And the dog pulls the other way because the dog sees the cars and the person doesn't. And, and the point is that when you have autonomous systems, there are cases where you want them not to do what you ask them to, rather than kind of cooperate in the naive sense. And so my, my question was, when you're approaching the, the, the issues um, generally, are you generally assuming that the, both sides have access to the same information? Are you assume, are you not assuming that? Have, have you looked into kind of dynamics that are similar to that? I personally haven't done much looking into this, but as a, as a general thing, most of the studies of kind of multi-agent learning, et cetera, very often assume partial observability and the fact that agents will be having different observations and will be needing to act differently based on those things and infer what else is going on kind of off the screen, so to speak. So that definitely comes up. This is not necessarily true in the standard kind of game theoretic analyses, although you obviously do have imperfect information games and so on, where there is hidden information going on. To, to yeah, to get to your to your I guess original point as well about there might be there might be situations in which we don't want the the kind of the delegated agent in some sense to actually do exactly what the what the principal wants, and this might in fact be in the principal's best interests. I think this is absolutely right. I think this also props up in the alignment literature as well as a general as a generic problem. I think in some sense, kind of just being able to have an AI system do exactly what you want, especially a kind of arbitrarily kind of powerful one and so on, is in some sense that kind of is already kind of a very high bar, but that absolutely you might always not want this. I think especially this gets interesting in the context of, again, cooperation problems where you might have things that you want that are bad for society, right? If we're in a, the commons and I want, I, I'm the principal and I want my AI system to go and like hoover up all the fish from the lake and there's no fish left for anyone else, then this is great that things aligned for me, but sucks for everyone else. That's, that's pretty low welfare probably. And but in especially another kind of important class of these sorts of problems come up in a case where we might want agents that actually act kind of pro-socially on our behalves, even if they would be kind of less, even if that's not totally individually rational, because it leads to actually much better kind of outcomes overall. Um, but how to manage those trade-offs and how to kind of aggregate various people's values into kind of individual AI systems, especially those deployed on behalf of individuals, I think is also very complicated and, and might end up being one of the areas where kind of technical work has to interface with kind of governance work and policy work and so on in a, in a much bigger way to kind of overcome some of those sorts of challenges. I, just to, to flag one thing, you said that this is addressed in some of the multi-agent systems work. My understanding is that almost all of that work is looking at multiple agents that you're training simultaneously in concert with one another, rather than building agents that can cooperate, even if they weren't built from the ground up to cooperate with these specific other agents, which I think that the general problem is the one we care about you're already specifying that they're supposed to be cooperating and it's not really cooperative AI as a risk. It's just, oh, let's build a system that has parts that works. Yep. And that is mostly true. It is fortunately increasingly less true. So there is more and more work that is doing the first thing, but it's, it's, it's small work at the moment. So there's work on these kind of generalized kind of sequential social dilemmas and so on. There's also just recently, kind of a new version came out of a kind of benchmark system of called Melting Pot, which is created by some people at DeepMind that we're working with at the moment, where the idea is that you have a whole suite of different environments and you have a whole suite of various populations and you want to train an agent that kind of robustly does well and cooperates with a bunch of them, not just the ones that you're trained to, 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 to do well with. So yeah, there is, so the idea is kind of this social generalization aspect as opposed to this like 
classical kind of generalization to other environments that we often think about in, in multi in, in machine learning. So yeah, that, but you're right that the vast majority of work does not consider that historically, at least I would say. Awesome. Thank you. We had Morgan as well with a question specifically to the workshop in case you want to unmute and ask. Yeah, absolutely. The workshop looks really fascinating. I was wondering if it tied into some of the past work that has come from a little bit more of the kind of science, technology, society, histories, justice work on refusals and tech refusals. So like UC Berkeley did a workshop a few years ago on that. So just curious about the overlaps in issue areas. Nice. Which workshop are you referring to? Sorry, are you referring to the one that David mentioned before about the, what was it? Yeah, this might be a question more for David, just cool. whether the upcoming Rebellion workshop is tied into past ideas of kind of tech refusal. I have no idea, but I'm about to send the link to this conference to two of the organizers because it seems somewhat relevant. And if they haven't heard of it, I feel like they probably would want to have. So I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not involved with that workshop. I just know about it. Okay, well, then maybe the last question is for me, which is the question that you always get at the end of a fourth and so on, which is if people are excited about your work, how can they help? What's like outstanding things? If you're hiring, feel free to say so. If you have any outstanding collaborations that you're interested in drawing people's attention to, now is an amazing time. Yeah, it sounds great. Man, there's so many ways. I think the easiest thing is basically just to just email me. And because I think this is a really, so, relatively rapidly growing area, but it's still very small. And there is lots, I think, that people from various kind of disciplines and domains and backgrounds can contribute to some of these areas. It's a really interesting kind of interdisciplinary area in that sense. Things that are on the horizon include various kind of academic workshops that we'll be hosting later in the year, hopefully a kind of competition at Neurips. So if you're that way inclined, if you're a multi-agent RL type person, then you want to do that. Various kind of write-ups, if you're interested in contributing kind of writing, if you're interested in helping us kind of, yeah, kind of do, we're doing some kind of preparing some courses, preparing some resources. What else are we doing? If you've got, if you've got a cool idea and you want to work on this sort of stuff, we are a grant making organization. We provide grants. You should submit an application to us. Yeah. All, all sorts of interesting things. We're doing some research in house. Yeah. Bunch of different kind of talks, et cetera. So yeah, just. The short, the short answer is just email me and ask, and there'll no, no doubt be something that kind of overlaps and is interesting, but, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's, that's kind of it. Oh, and yeah, also we're hiring like people, program manager, kind of various research analysts, all sorts of stuff. So all, all, all of the above. Wonderful. Okay. Well then I look forward to people emailing you. This was really fantastic. Thank you so much. It was a lot to digest and really happy about yeah, all the work then and that you guys are doing. It's it's been about time that an organization like this existed. And I'm really ha happy that yeah, you, you you guys are taking some. Thanks everyone. I'll see you for the next one. And yeah, have a wonderful day to all of you. Bye, Louis. Cool. Thanks, Alison. And thanks to everyone as well for the for yeah, the great questions and the attendance. Um, yeah, really appreciated it.